Good morning, everybody. I'm Hilary Stupa with Qdabra Software, um, and this is our weekly Thursday webinar. I hope everybody is having a great week so far. Um, today, I am here to talk to you probably kind of briefly, if you've ever had me for a webinar before, you'll know I can ramble on, um, about some issues you may face if you are moving to SharePoint 2013. Uh, these issues are mainly going to be with your browser forms, and we will just get started and talk about those. Let's see if I can remember how to work PowerPoint. There we go. Um, you've probably seen this slide before. Just a little bit about us. Uh, the InfoPath Dev community is there for you. We've got pay-as-you-go support. We've got training. Um, we've got tools and templates, all kinds of things for you to try. So do check out qdabber.com for more information on any of these things. So. If you're moving to SharePoint 2013, you need to understand that there's been a major change in authentication. Um, the default authentication is now claims-based. Uh, classic mode authentication, which is what was used previously, is being deprecated and has to be managed via PowerShell. Um, if you stick to classic, you can have other issues. There's an MSDN article on this that states that a lot of features in 2013 require claims mode. So um, while it's optional, there's some big square when you scare quotes around that optional. Um, there is a link here for some basic information on claims authentication and how it works. Um, it is actually, it's, it's not terribly challenging reading. Uh, it may be a little dry. So do check that out if you need to learn more on that. Now, the reason you might care about this is what it changes for you is what gets returned by the username function in InfoPath. Um, and if your forms use the user profile web service or other SharePoint web services, if you're on Office 365, it can cause some issues for you. Uh, if you're using the user profile web service and you are not setting the account name field on load, which most of us who use the user profile web service do not do that because that's part of the magic, right? You just add this user profile, uh, get user by name method to your form. Uh, you have the data connection execute on load. You don't bother setting the account name and it just automatically gets information about the current user of the form. So, so the general scenario I think that most of us have probably used is exactly this. You know, execute data connection on load, don't set the account name. This can cause you some problems in a claims-based environment. We'll talk about that. And if you're basing any other logic off what's returned from the username function, you may have some surprises in store that we can look at. So you care, <laughs> frankly. If, if any of these things apply to your forms, you probably care about this change. Um, so uh, how much you care uh, depends on what kind of forms you have. If you're using browser forms, you care. If you're using filler, not so much. Um, if you're using Office 365, you're going to find some differences there between what, what you would have to change in terms of your data connections than what you're going to find in on-prem uh, or, or if you're running your own SharePoint server. Okay. Um, so for filler forms, you probably aren't going to need to change anything. You're probably just fine. Just go on about your merry way. For browser forms, you're going to want your data connection to no longer execute on load. You're going to want to set that to not execute on load. And then you're going to want to add form rules to set the account name query field, and then another rule to execute the query. Now, one thing that you should be aware of that I haven't pointed out in this slide is if you are you renegade you, still running classic authentication on your SharePoint 2013 install. In your browser form, uh, the document that I read about this stated you're going to need to prepend the domain name to the username. So you're going to want to make sure that you're passing in username plus uh, the domain, domain name backslash username as the account name. Uh, for those of you in larger orgs where you've got multiple domains, obviously, this could get a little tricky, right? For, for those of us in small orgs where we've got a single domain, yeah, it's not so bad. We use a concat statement. We throw the domain and a backslash onto the 
to the results of the username function. But just be aware if you're running classic authentication in your SharePoint 2013 install that you're going to, for your browser form, need to prepend the domain name on what is returned by the account name function or the username function to populate the account name query field before you execute your user profile web service. Let me try that one more time because I got a lot of the words in the wrong order. If you are running your SharePoint 2013 uh, installation, your on-premises installation using classic authentication, you will want to change, follow these rules, change your data connection to not execute on load, and add a form rule to set the account name query field and execute the query for your user profile web service, get username data connection. However, in this scenario that you are running claims, you need to prepend your domain name in a backslash. Okay, so it's domain name backslash username, just like when you sign into your machine. And of course, the, the problem there is what will you do if you've got people with, with, different, uh, with different domains? Okay, and moving on. I'm sorry, I'm noticing some, some comments from Bruce. Um, so moving on, for browser forms in Office 365, you, again, change those data connection to not execute on load because you're not going to get a username passed in automatically to the uh, account name that works. You're going to need to add form rules to set the account name query field and execute the query. Um, in Office 365, now I didn't find this to be the case in my on-premises SharePoint. I did find it to be the case in Office 365. I had to change the data connection to UDCX and you need to create a secure store user ID and modify the data connection to use the secure store user ID. And we'll look at modifying a UDCX to use SSO. Here's some additional Office 365 resources. Um, these two links, and, and do the feedback after the webinar so you get the slides. You can, you can look these up online yourself if you want to, too. These are SPO authentication issues with untrusted InfoPath forms in a Windows claims environment. Um, and these two videos, uh, there's a part one and a part two, and they kind of walk through some of the same things I'm talking about here and I'm going to show you. And this link down here is for creating a secure store target application in Office 365. The steps are slightly different there um, than they are in um, than they are in an on-premises. Okay, so moving on. Um, more on Office 365. Look, one document I read that I can't include with a package because as far as I can see, it's not out in the wild. Um, one document I read had these steps saying, you know, you've got to complete the following steps, create a user ID and security group in the customer's active directory, blah, 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 um, in order to create this, this functional secure store uh, ID that you can use for the user profile web service in Office 365. I was unsuccessful creating a SSO that I could use in Office 365 for user profile. Um, I didn't have a ton of time to mess with it, so I didn't go contacting any support resources or anything like that. I just basically took the same steps I would with on-prem. I created my SSO, added credentials, and so on. Um, however, the documentation I'm seeing states that it can be done, so I would definitely suggest you, you contact some level of support through your Office 365 plan in order to get some assistance with this if you if you are using user profile web service in a browser form and want to be able to do this in Office 365. Okay, just to have get some help getting that SSO set up correctly. Um, so the username function itself, you know, for anybody who has used uh, browser versus filler, even in SharePoint 2010, um, you know that you may see different results. Um, not as dramatically different as you're about to see though. All of these scenarios can cause different results to be returned to the username function. Now, in filler, in filler, I'm consistently seeing my domain name uh, with <laughs> some capitalization. In browser, in 2010, my username was returned all lowercase, and and this is what I'm kind of kind of uh, referring to is is I found early on going from uh, filler to browser that there were there were case differences there. And so in filler I generally use a translate function or key rolls or something and toss that username into all lowercase so that all of my comparatives are, are lowercase. But if you're using the username function 
as a comparative with something else, like maybe some list information you're pulling back and so forth. You just need to be aware of the fact that you're going to see some casing differences. Um, XPath is case sensitive, right? And so these two things, these two Hillary S and Hillary S, they are not the same thing. If we move down to uh, the third screenshot here, this is my username. This is what's returned from username with a browser form in an on-prem SharePoint 2013 claim site. Okay, so in my, if I open this same form and filler, I get the top screenshot. I get my name with the, the caps in there. And if I open the same form in browser, I get that third screenshot. And finally, you can see in the fourth screenshot what we see in Office 365. Okay, so now we don't have a username match at all. You can see my email addresses in there. So it's, it's just something you need to be aware of. I think most of us, as we design forms, we design them and we hit preview and we hit preview and we hit preview and everything works. And then, and then we uh, deploy them to the browser where we wanted to use them and we are surprised when things do not work. So this is one of those differences you want to be aware of when you're doing your form design. And here we are to the demos. So I've got some published forms to show you. They're in different states of disarray. Um, we're going to look at an error message or two and we're going to modify the UDCX to use an SSO. So I am going to change what I am sharing and I'm going to try to change what I am sharing. You know what? I am just going to drag my browser window over here and see if I can just cover up what I am currently sharing. There we go. That works, I think. I'm having my usual PowerPoint struggles. I am, I am not the best at these PowerPoint things. Okay, so here is my 2010 form. And let me pop up as well. Excuse this messy folder. I'm going to pop this guy up while we're waiting for him. I'm going to pop this guy up in design mode as well. Okay, so here's my here's my 2010 browser form. You can see I've got my my lowercase username, um, and it's returning you know some of my user information. Here is the same guy. We're going to look at him in preview, and so again here's my 2010 form previewing, waiting, waiting, waiting. Hmm. It will open eventually here. We're contacting the server for information. Well, oh, there we go. All right, so here, here we are in preview as well. So you can see I'm getting definitively more information back when I'm previewing than I am getting here in the browser. So that's just something else to, to keep in mind. Um, so that's my that's my 2010 scenario. You can see our big difference here is our two differences in the account names. And right now I'm not setting the account name field in either of these. I'm just running the state of connection on load, which is, again, I think how we probably most of us set these forms up in the past. Um, this one is my on-premises SharePoint 2013 site. And this form is set up to actually execute the data connection on load. And so as you can see, you know, we get an error. We've got a correlation ID. If I were to go look that up, I will show you what I would find. I went ahead and copied it. Went ahead and copied it over into another text file so we wouldn't have to go sorting in through the, the error log from SharePoint. So this is what we would find, is we would find something along these lines. Uh, the data connection failed. Um, Da, 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 the remote server returned an error. A user with the account name Hillary S could not be found. Okay, and that's because, as we know, it's looking for uh, something different. It's looking for what it considers the username in claims, in this claims environment, which here is that username. So here's my claims username. When the form was opened by you leaving the account name field blank, it was passing in Hillary S. And this is what we actually need. So if we query using this account name, hey, all of a sudden it likes us. Okay, so that is what that is what one of these errors that we would see actually looks like when we go and look in the log. Okay. Um, now here is the same form set up so that 
it will set the account name field. Instead of executing on load now, I'm setting the account name field and then I'm executing the query. So if we take a quick look at those rules, let me pop open in design view. Just, you know, it, this is not, this is not complicated stuff, but we might as well take a quick look at the rules since they're there. So the big change here is this data connection Right? We're not executing on load, so you can see it doesn't have anything down here about getting data every time the form is opened, right? And so it's not executing on load. I'm setting account name to username because I'm claims. I don't need to worry about, you know, concatenating domain in or anything like that. That would be if I was running classic. And then I'm querying using get user profile by name. So I'm just doing all of this in form load rules now instead of um, letting the data connection execute on load. Let me show you. I just want to, I want to show you this real quick. Manage data connections. A lot of times, um, <laughs> this is an aside, okay? A lot of times I see people walking through data connections again and again and again to, to get information about them, right? Um, but just so you're aware, all of that, most of the information you need is right here under the details, like data retrieved every time form is opened. So if you've got 25 data, let's say one of your coworkers hands off a form to you and you've got 25 data connections you're unfamiliar with, you, you don't need to walk through each of them to, to learn about them. You can at least get some information here. Not everything, but some information. So that is that little digression. My third form here this is the same form we we're looking at in step two. It's just been changed to use a UDCX connection. So I converted the data connection to UDCX and then I modified that UDCX connection to pass in an SSL. And we're going to look at that authentication here. So we'll just pop this guy open. He's, he's working on it. He's thinking about it. There he is. Okay, and so this one I'm using UDCX, really no difference here, um, but I've set it up to use UDCX and SSO. Here is my Office 365 site. I think this one's set up to fail. Um, I think he is going to try to query on load. So show error details again. We've got a correlation ID. Basically it's the 5566 error. Same, same thing. Um, except for now I can't go hop onto the server and look at the logs, right? Uh, but we can, we can see we've got this, this difference in the, in the username yet again. So let's take a quick look at the UDCX and what changes we've made to it. Um, generally speaking, if you are the SharePoint admin, um, and you've got access to, sh to central admin, you would set up the SSO there and then you would use that SSO in your UDCX. So I'm going to pop a couple things open here real quick. All right. So here is, and I'm going to set this to XML so we've got some highlighting because I'm just uh, visually lazy. So here is my original UDCX. So we've gone through in InfoPath the steps of converting our data connection to a UDCX that saves it in a data connection library, and then we have to download it modify it, re-upload it, make sure it's approved, and then it's ready to go. Okay, so here is my UDCX. This is the line I'm concerned with. It's currently commented out. In order to modify this to use SSO, they, they nicely have it almost ready to go, right? All we have to do is, whoa, wrong language. That was exciting, wasn't it? All we have to do is make this so it's not commented, right? So we remove the comments. And then we put in the app ID of our SSO. So either you will create that when you set up the SSO or your uh, SharePoint admin will create that for you and they will give you the SSO ID. Okay, so there's a lot of documentation online for how to create a secure store application ID. I have to look it up every time myself because I don't, I don't do it very often. And when I was doing this the other day, I got it set up but didn't remember to add the credentials to it. So, you know, these things, <laughs> these things can take a few goes when you're not used to them. But the big things here are you need to put in your app ID that's been provided to you or that you've created. And then your credential type is NTLM. After you have that set up, then you can re-upload it to your data connections library and from there your form will use this uh, app ID. It'll use this, this credential to, to execute the get user profile 
uh, the get username web service method. So that way you have this scenario where the form is using a UDCX, the UDCX is using the SSO, and that provides the authentication. And as I said, um, from what I've read online, from what I've seen in the videos referenced in an earlier slide here, I'm going to pop back to it, the videos referenced here. Um, this is apparently the right way to do this in Office 365. And as I said, I was unable to get my Office 365 form set up successfully prior to this. So I, I don't want to uh, imply that it's just step one, step two, step three. Uh, definitely SSO works in this scenario because it works in my on-prem server. Uh, but be aware that you may need a little extra time. You may need a little support uh, in order to get this set up and running on Office 365. And that is actually... Uh, everything I've got. Um, if you have any questions, be sure to pop them up in chat. I see there's some questions here already. How are these different for the Active Directory? Okay, so let me let me start with um, with Bruce. He said you very likely will have to change your 2010 filler forms going into SP 2013. You can't even open InfoPath Filler Forms 2010. Okay, so Bruce, this is a scenario I didn't try. I didn't take an InfoPath 2010 form and publish it to SharePoint 2013. I actually had them saved as uh, InfoPath 2013 forms. So you're saying you haven't been able to open an InfoPath 2010 form if it's published to, to SharePoint 2013? Is, is that what you're saying? Oh, unless you have InfoPath 2013 installed, filler forms, okay. So I think what Bruce is saying here, he's got another comment in the questions, you guys can probably see this too, is that his experience has been that unless you have InfoPath 2013 installed, filler forms published to SharePoint 2013 won't open with the InfoPath 2010 client. And that's not something I've tried, and that's not something I've experienced. I do have an InfoPath 2010 machine set up, so uh, when I have a chance, I may try that, but I've not run into that problem. So I guess that's that's worth knowing, that, that if you're upgrading to SharePoint 2013 and you've got filler forms, it may be a scenario where you need to get your users all on InfoPath 2013. But definitely, um, based on, on what Bruce has outlined here, I would say, uh, as you guys are getting ready to float your trial for SharePoint 2013, be sure that's something you test. Um, so the next was Tom Renfo. How are these different for the Active Directory web service? So I think Tom is asking about um, DBXL and the DBXL's Active Directory web service, which is, um, gosh, you know, my thought is it's going to continue returning your AD username. Um, I have not set up a form with get use with with the AD web service and published it to SharePoint 2013 as a browser form to check that. Um, I'll do that and get back to you on that. Uh, Gus, you're saying you're running Moss 2007 want to update. Would you recommend to go from 2007 to 2013 at once or upgrade to 2010? So you're talking about maybe like a, a migration from um, one version to the next, not like a nice clean install and go forward. Um, you know, I'm not a server girl, and so I am probably not the best resource for that. I wouldn't want to definitively say that, that you should follow one migration strategy or another. I, I apologize for not knowing this. Um, I, it, drop me an email. It's hillary at uh, hillary.stupa at qdabber.com and I have, we've got a guy on staff who's, who knows this stuff and I'll ping Jim and ask him what his suggestion is, okay? Uh, InfoPath 2013 with SharePoint 2010, any issues is what Susan asked. So I'm using InfoPath 2013 and have been for a while now and I create InfoPath 2010 forms and publish them up to SharePoint 2010 uh, without any challenges. So, and, and I create InfoPath 2007 forms, and I actually have in progress right now, bang head on desk, some InfoPath 2003 forms with code that I'm actually working on in InfoPath 2013. I haven't had, I haven't had any problems at all. Um, 
the only thing I have seen is occasionally a little security model difference, but I mean nothing blocking, um, and it's all related to code stuff. And and so I I haven't had problems publishing to SharePoint 2013. I haven't had problems creating compatible forms from. I mean, to, to SharePoint 2010, and I haven't had problems creating compatible forms from InfoPath 2013 to use on SharePoint 2010, or problems creating uh, compatible forms to use in Filler. So if you are thinking about upgrading to InfoPath 2013 on your machine, but your org is still using SharePoint 2010, man, if it were me, I wouldn't hesitate. I would, I would go ahead and do it. Um, the next question from... Tom is using SSO. Have you seen any issues with machine accounts as the credentials tagged as the machine name instead of the actual user? So, Tom, you know, as I just showed when I was, well, I guess this isn't a very definitive test. As I was just say, as I just showed, it's showing my username and the one where I'm using SSO. But, you know, I set that SSO to my credentials. Um, my assumption is that the SSO is using those credentials to connect to the web service, but since I am passing in the account name in the account name query field, it really doesn't matter what credentials are in the web service in this instance because what I'm doing here, and I of course closed my form, but remember what I'm doing here is I'm setting that query field in the get user by name, I'm setting that query field to my username. So it is running that query for me as my username. It just happens in the SSO to be running them under the stored credentials in the SSO. Now, what would happen if you were using this to submit something somewhere? Or if you were using it for a, a query on a list or something, and the user in your credentials stored in your SSO didn't have permissions to that list, well, my guess is, you know, when we're using an SSO, we're using those credentials. So whatever those credentials are, are going to be used for a submit, and whatever those credentials, and, and then would show as, as modified by or whatever, depending on what you're submitting to. And then whatever those credentials are would be used for a query and would be restricted by permissions. And then, I, I, Tom, I'm sorry, I don't understand your third and fourth questions, that there are problems if not opened as a specific user shows modified. Okay, so I think, I think what you're saying is that um, if I do use an SSO and submit, it would show modified by as the account the SSO is running under, which, which like I said, is what I would have expected to have happened. Um, Anything else? So, like I said, kind of short and sweet, just some gotchas to watch out for. Um, I highly recommend, if you are changing your SharePoint environment, that you do testing well in advance, um, so, you know, to find things like this. Um, and I really hope that... Uh, you guys have good luck with SharePoint 2013. There's some stuff about it that's pretty cool, um, some stuff I'm really enjoying. There's the learning curve. Uh, you'll want to make sure that, that you allow time for that learning curve as you migrate. You'll want to make sure that you verify everything that you're doing is still working as you would anticipate with this change from classic to claims authentication. Um, send us your post-webinar feedback. Uh, we'll wrap up this stuff with the demo templates. Oh, and I have a special surprise in this folder that is a that will come with these these demo templates. That is a PowerShell script um, that I did not write, uh, <laughs> but it is a PowerShell script that I just happen to have my hands on that will um, that will go through and identify InfoPath templates in your environment that have a data connection to the user profile service web service. Okay, so this can can help you find the forms that may be a problem when you uh, go to SharePoint 2013. Okay, and so with that, I hope you guys have a great day and hope to talk to you guys again soon. Thanks so much for attending.